continuing a message and building a foundation of love. As I was uh, going through Matthew 7, 24, I was struck by that uh, portion of that phrase that says, and the house did not fall. The house did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. So I, I gave it a little bit of a subtitle, the house that stands firm. And uh, right before we get into Matthew 7, which is our, our starting point today, actually, uh, we go to Romans 12, 2, that says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The, the Bible tells us that we are to remove all those things that clutter, all of that stuff that we've accumulated over our years, and let our hearts and our mind now be filled with God's word, which washes away all the bad and fills us with good powerful, uh, permanent truth. And Matthew chapter 7 is Jesus speaking to a multitude of people. And he tells them, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall. For it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Great was its fall. The the house that he's talking about is not physical houses, right? It's talking about um, my life. It's talking about your life. That's what he's referring to. The life that is built upon the teachings of Jesus Christ, that's built upon trusting in him, is the house that no matter what storms may come, and storms are going to come, um, we'll be able to weather the storms of life, the disappointments of life, the tragedies, the ups and downs in relationships, sickness, lack, downturn in economy, um, and on the surface, both of these houses look the same. Just as many times we look at people and they all, you really can't tell if that person that's walking down the street is a believer or not until you look at that person's life and the, their walk and their talk. Um, and in this particular case, the Lord is telling us real clearly, uh, the life that's built upon faulty beliefs, lies, dangerous opinions, dangerous teachings, the one that's built upon unsolid foundation, when the stresses of life come, those economic downturns, somebody that is close to you betrays you, um, a, a devastating illness comes, uh, your, your business goes under, you lose your job. And Jesus said, those are the storms, that's the rising water, that's the pounding surf, that's the winds of trauma. All of that is going to expose who we really are, because... Charles Stanley put it real well. He says, um, the storms of life do not make you. The storms of life reveal who you are. And, and that's very true. And so the first thing we see is that the house he's talking about is, is our life. It's our life. The second thing uh, is that I choose a type of foundation. This is what we learned last week. I choose the type of foundation I'm going to build my life on. I don't have, if the storms come, and I don't weather the storm very well. I really don't have anybody to point a finger at except myself. Because each one of these builders knew what they were building on. It was not a surprise. Choices were made. And, and the building of the life that I'm going to talk to you about is, is uh, and get, you know, just hide it, tuck it away real, real safe. I'm going to talk about your pocketbook, okay? Building a, your foundation, your Building a firm foundation financially. That's what I'm going to be speaking about today. And it starts by, by receiving Christ, as Ephesians says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And I want to look at two particular uh, verses that speak about this building process in the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs. The first one is Proverbs 24.3 that says, Through wisdom... A house is built, and by understanding, it is 
established. And the second one says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Look at that. It's two things. I make a choice, but I depend upon the power, the grace, the resources of God for that house to be built. Because it is a matter of faith that we establish these things because we act upon what he is trying to tell us and teach us. So yes, wisdom builds my life, but that depends upon God himself being put first. Otherwise, it's no use. It's of no value. And I was thinking of this as one particular verse came to mind, and it's a verse that I, we go to, and we know it. We're, I think we're all familiar with it. It's a declaration of faith made by Joshua. You remember Joshua? Joshua was the assistant to Moses, the deliverer. Joshua walked beside him, helped him, served him, um, and he was in the background during the entire phase that Moses led the people out of captivity and through the wilderness. And he first, is, first surfaces just a few weeks after Moses does that. We see Joshua at, at the prime of his life. He's like 40-something years old. He's strong. He's healthy. And he is one of 12 men that's chosen to go into the promised land, scout the land, bring back a report. Remember? They're called the 12 spies, and one from every tribe. Joshua is sent forth, and when he comes back, he's only one of two that brings back a faith report. He says the land is fantastic. There's resources. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. The, the, the produce, the, the livestock, everything that's there is wonderful, and, and we need to go in, and we need to do what God is telling us. Caleb does the same thing. But the other ten discourage the people, remember, and they say, yes, what they're saying is true, but. What they're saying is true, but there's giants in there that we're going to have to fight. And in their eyes, we're like grasshoppers. Remember that statement. So what happens is Joshua and Caleb kind of have to pay for the lack of faith of the other ten and the rest of the people. So they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Um, They actually don't wander. The Holy Spirit leads them. But in... At the end of the 40 years, now Moses is no longer able to lead them into the land. It's Joshua who does. So Joshua takes them in, and they fight the giants and win, uh, just like he said they were going to. They take possession of the land that God had promised them. And this is Joshua. I'm giving you this because now we're coming to the end of Joshua's life when he makes this declaration that we're familiar with. And it's in chapter 24 of Joshua, verse 15. And as I was studying it and looking at it, my, my heart went to the chapter right before it, the preceding chapter, which is chapter 23. And this is what it says at the very first verse. It says, now Joshua was old and well advanced in years. Joshua lived, according to the Bible, to the ripe old age of 110. And then he died. And so this is towards the latter end of that 110 years. And he stands before the people, and you know what he does? He tells them and reminds them of everything that God had done. You remember when God promised us this, and he did it. Remember when God promised us this, and he did it. Remember when God did this, and his grace, and his goodness, and his mercy, and and all of that. And there's three things I just want you to see, because we don't have time to look at the entire chapter. But as a preface to what I'm about to read, um, the wise builder makes a conscious choice to build his house. For himself and for his home, for his family, okay? And there's three things that we see. Uh, In Joshua 23, verses 6 and 7, Joshua teaches the people, put the word of God first. Put the word of God first. When you put the word of God first, you're putting God first. Because you're putting his thoughts, his opinions, and his power right there at your disposal. The second thing he teaches them is be faithful before God. Live faithfully before God. Because you're putting his word first, you're honoring him, now live a life that at the, at the end of your life, you'll be able to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. And the, second, the third thing he says is love God with all your heart. Love him supremely. So having said that, now we go to this particular verse because now he says, now 
I just finished telling you of God and all he has done and all his goodness and all his grace and all his mercy. Now, now the rubber meets the road. Now you have a choice to make. And look at the choice that he sets before them. It's real interesting. He says, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. He's giving them a choice. Serve the gods that we left behind, which are really not gods, or serve the gods in the land where we're living now, which are also really not gods. And then he makes a a tremendous, a very valiant, a very bold statement. He says, but I don't care what you choose. I've made my choice. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In other words, my kids don't have a choice. They're going to serve God. While they're under my roof, they will serve the Lord. While my, my children are living, depending upon me, they will serve the Lord. They will worship God. We're going to go to church. We're going to give our tithes. I'm going to teach them and train them that they should be brought up in the care and admonition of the Lord. He says, the choices you make are your choices to make. My choices to make will impact me and will impact my family now and for 1,000 generations. Therefore, I choose wisely. Remember that, that scene from Indiana Jones? Oh, I chose wisely. And so Joshua chooses wisely, and his family is blessed after him. And it's a choice that we ourselves make. You see, um, the wise builder makes the conscious choice and decision just as he did. If you're going to build your life upon the rock, that is a wise choice. But you know, it doesn't happen by chance. It's a, it's a deliberate choice we make with every single decision and every single action of our life. And it's the same thing. Our kids will not be trained by osmosis, by being close to us. It's, it's a deliberate thing that we have to make. It's choices. It's living the faith before them every single day of their lives and our lives. We model the life of faith to those that we love. We take every chance we can to teach them, to instruct them in the ways of the Lord. But I told you that I was going to talk about building your financial house upon the rock. And that's really the the main focus for today's message. Because that in itself is is so true, guys. Um, We are now, I am now living as a result of the choices that I made many years ago. Especially financially. I am uh, going to be either uh, reaping the benefits or not of choices that I made in the past. Um, when he says that he's going to serve the Lord, it's in every single area of your life. And, and to, to get to this, this point, before I read this next verse, and it's a familiar one too from the, look, the book of Luke, um, I'm going to get really, really practical today. Okay? And kind of define to you what I mean by building your financial house. Because um, I I have lacked in doing this in in times past, in years past. Uh, Pastor Frank made a a true declaration. But there seems to be in in the, and if you were listening to KVMV this morning on the way to to church, there was one verse that they were talking about. And that's the verse that says, uh, do not lay up treasures on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven. You heard that verse, right? And it's true. And so there seems to be some kind of strain and stress. Wait a minute, Pastor. Are you telling me to lay up treasures here on earth? Or or not? But what about that verse that says that I shouldn't because I should only focus on the spiritual? That's not what the Word of God says. Remember the verse that says, give and it will be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Men will give unto your bosom. That's true too. What about the verse that we quote in Malachi? You know, bring all your tithes into the storehouse. And then God says, test me now in this. I'll, I'll rebuke the devourer. I'll pour out so much blessing you cannot contain it. So you see, there is no contradiction and there is no conflict. Both are true. God said in John 10:10, 10, 10, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come to give you life and give it to you in abundance. In abundance or Drowning in debt, barely able to make ends meet. Living from paycheck to paycheck. 
Is that life in abundance? Everybody say, no. No, it's not. So God tells us this in, in the book of Luke. He says, which of you intending to build a tower uh, does not sit down first, count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest, after he has laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him. So I was going to get practical. Here's what I'm going to ask you to kind of, together as a family, begin to lay a strategy together. Husband, wife, kids. Ask yourself simple questions. For instance, where do you want to be in 10 years or 15 years financially? Uh, for, for, the, for the youth that are here, for the kids that are here, ask yourself simple questions like, uh, you know, this is a, a common question any old person asks a kid. What do you want to be when you grow up? You know, they'll come up with, with a cute answer. Says, well, I want to be a doctor, and I want to be an astronaut, and I want to be a fireman. Okay? And we just pat them on the head. But no. What do you want to do with your life? Do you, do you want to go into vocation? Do you, do you want to be a welder, an electrician, a plumber? Do, do you want to... Uh, do you want to go into the professions? you want to be a, a doctor? You know, God forbid, a lawyer, you know? Um, do you want to go into the ministry? You see what I'm saying? And so, okay, you, you've already said, okay, I, I, I feel this. I'd like to do that. That's great. Okay, what's it going to take for me to get there? Okay, plan that out. How much am I going to need for college? What am I going to need to do? Where do I gravitate to in order to be... Because God will give us wisdom if we ask him for it. And he'll do it generously. He will not. I mean, what loving heavenly father is going to listen to his son saying, Lord, I don't know what to do, what school to go to, what to study. I don't, where am I going to get the money? Lord, I don't want to come out of school drowning in student loans. Lord, I need you to help me with this. And, and God up in heaven says, here's a rock. No, he'll show us ways. He'll give us wisdom. We have to plan. We have to, we have to take, I think, certain strategies. And, and that's really the, 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 today's message is, I hope, so practical. And it'll awaken you to things that you knew probably in the back of your mind, but, but you hadn't put it down on paper. Because, and, and guys, this age group that I'm speaking to now, in comparison to the Spanish age group, Is different, okay? And, I, and that's not to, to uh, bring them down in any way or to lift you up either. But they, there's some experience there, okay? There's some wisdom there, okay? Uh, there's youth and strength here. There's future and opportunity here, okay? Over there, you know, many of them are not able to take these things that I'm telling you and move and run with them. But you are. You are. Uh, Pastor Frank was telling us the, the other day that he's grateful for a man who used to attend our church many years ago. He died about, I think, about eight years ago or so. Um, and he's the one who put him onto those education health savings accounts. And so little by little over the past, what, 16 years or so? 16 years, he's been setting aside a little bit for his son's education, who's about to graduate in a couple of years, a year and a half. And there's already 40000 bucks in the kitty. Can anybody say, not too shabby? Why? He received counsel, but he didn't just let the words fall to the ground. He said, let's set it up. And he began. And so simple but profound truths that are found in the word of God that we can put to use in our lives will get us farther than we realize. Uh, Moses, back to Moses in Deuteronomy, he writes this. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Look at this. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your homes on your gates. Uh, I mentioned three strategies. The first one is found in this verses four and five. You start by teaching your family to love God. 
That's how you start. When you make a choice to love the Lord yourself, and then you start teaching them to love God. Guys, you open up resources that are unfathomable. Resources of, of wisdom and understanding and strength and wisdom that, that takes you and takes them beyond where they could go on their own. I didn't brag on Roddy and, and Alexa. I, I'm going to brag, even though they're probably in the coffee shop. Shame on them. But that's okay. Roddy, you know, is the choir director here in San Benito High. Right? Um, and, uh, he, uh, and Alexa teaches in Riondo, I believe. Well, uh, there is probably coming out either in the Seminary News or in the Harlingen uh, Valley Morning Star, one of the two, the fact that as a choir director, they did a first this, uh, this week. He had three of his students reach the state level, three of them, for the very first time in the history of the San Benito High School. You know, that's a good thing. Roddy is the first to give the credit to the Lord. Okay? He gives the credit to the Lord. But these are things that don't just happen. They're things that God uses wisdom asked for. I know for a fact that, that they seek the Lord, that they ask him for help, and he does. And so that's just one very, very brief example. But here it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. When you teach your kids to love God, when you teach your family to love God, you are preparing them supernaturally. For that relationship that will last forever. And because of that, they're going to have a friendship with the Lord that will last forever. And so they'll go to him as a friend. When they're in lack, when they're in need, and God's going to answer. The second thing we see here is we need to give them guidelines. And, and I'm, going to sh I'm going to share um, three or four guidelines financially in just a bit, and then we're going to finish up, okay? It says, these commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. These guidelines that we teach our kids, practical, practical things. Uh, and, and the final one, real quick, do it at all times, not just in church, not just in Sunday school. Don't depend upon the Sunday school teachers to teach your kids. But do it while you're waiting in line to drop them off at school. Speak to them when? When uh, you're, they're getting dressed in the morning, when you're going to Chick-fil-A. In other words, it's not scripted. It doesn't have to be, you know, thus saith the Lord, child. No, it's... <laughs> no, it's... I love you, and I learned this. I want to share with you. Amen? Okay. <laughs> Praise God. So, so what should I advise my family? The first one is avoid the trap of death. This is one of the simplest things, but it's also one of the most profound. And by the way, as I step uh, a little closer to you right now, I want you to, there's something in my heart that's, it, it's so, so precious and so sure in my heart. And that is that this year is going to be a good year. And it's going to be a good financial year for you too. It's, it's going to, you're going to have opportunities that you didn't expect. And there's going to be promotion, and there's going to be open doors for your future for you to take advantage of. Don't squander it. Squander. What is squander, Pastor? Don't waste those opportunities. Um, because, to be honest with you, there's going to come increase. And that increase can either lift us up or drag us down. Because, you know, suddenly, boy, that muscle car, I can afford that muscle car. Wives, tell your husband, you don't need a muscle car. Okay? iPhone, whatever it is, you know, that's going to keep us in debt for the next three years. No, we don't need that, that new iPhone. Amen? For those of you that were hoping for a new iPhone, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's true, guys. We... We, we get this increase and we're so, oh, thank, descansamos. You know, we, we kind of relax because, oh, there's more available. Unfortunately, we, if we're not careful, if we're not wise, you know, it slips through our fingers. There's a verse that says it goes into, into our pockets as if it, there were holes in our pockets. Oh, but the wise. Hmm. 
So, so this passage says, and, and look at this, guys. This amazes me because I know both of these verses separately. How many times have you heard some pastor or me say, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, right? And the other verse is, you know, there is the, the, the borrower is a servant to the lender. Were you aware that one follows the other? Maybe you were, I wasn't, until I started studying this. Look at this, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We always take that into the spirit realm, right? And it's true. You, you teach your kids principles of faith for them to walk in. You train them up in the way, sh- and they won't depart from it. But look at what you're going to teach them. The rich rules over the poor. And the borrower is servant to the lender. That's one of the truths we have to teach our kids. What does that mean? Stay out of debt. If you're in debt, get out of debt. Spend less than you make. Set aside and save that which you are not spending, okay? And I don't want to bring condemnation upon you. That's not the purpose for today's message. It's, it's for you to understand certain truths. One of them, it's true. You know that little um, Snow White saying, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go, right? Unfortunately, many of us do have to because we're in debt. And... And the Lord can give you wisdom and resources to get out of debt, if you ask him. And then wisdom to stay out once you're out of debt. Hallelujah. And so, what is debt? Well, it's owing somebody or owing somebody on behalf of somebody else. Owing somebody on behalf of somebody else. Can anybody say cosign? Our hearts are so big. We love so much. We want to help. And, and the, the logic of it is, you know, indisputable. If you'll just co-sign this for me so I can get this, and you fill in the blank, this car, this house, this mobile home, this whatever, okay? And so your heart is so big you want to help. And Bodicito, you know, his credit is not good enough. And, and you don't ask yourself, why isn't his credit good enough? <laughs> or, and this is okay, by the way. He's just starting out. That's valid because you want to help them out and you want to train them to do the right thing, but always do it with the right heart, with the right attitude. Meaning what? If you're going to help this young person out, then be prepared to pay when that young person does not pay. And don't let it create bitterness in your heart. You know, we've done this in times past. My wife and I, you know, we learned early on not to be co-signers. When the time came for us to do it, our attitude was, we are buying this thing. And not for us. (laughs) And it saved us so much heartache. So what do you do? Look at this is the verse I'm talking about, Proverbs 6 says, My son, if you put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands and pledged for a stranger, you have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. So do this. God even tells us what to do if we have co-signed. And you know the Lord is so amazing. I got a text on Friday. No. Saturday morning, yesterday, I got a text from somebody who had co-signed for a mobile home, okay? And the buyer was not able to pay it, and the mobile home was repossessed, and then the buyer passed away. So who are they coming after now? And he says, I just received this in the mail. I said, okay, well, let's see what we can do. Do this. What do you do? Do this to free yourself since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go to the point of exhaustion and give yourself, your neighbor, no rest. Give no sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Get out of the trap. Go humble yourself. What does that mean? doesn't matter if you're embarrassed. Better to be embarrassed than to be trapped. Amen? So, 
in a nutshell. Cosine bad. Okay. Praise God. The other thing that we teach our kids, apart from avoiding the trap of debt, and you know, um, I, I look back because my accountant asked me something, and I look back, and I realized that last year we used credit cards twice, okay? And we were able to pay them off at the end of the month. That, that's not debt, okay? That's basically temporarily using other people's money. <laughs> and if you have to do it, be sure that it's paid off within a short term, a month, two months, three months, okay? The other thing is teach our kids to respect the poor have concern for them. I'm not going to go into Leviticus 25, but there is God's teachings for the nation of Israel about how to treat those that are poor, that are in need. You help them out. You do for them whatever you can do. And then two other things that I want to finish with, and that is be wise regarding our, our retirement savings and our retirement income. Those are two separate things. Okay, kids here, they're, they're already zoning out, you know. But retirement, come on, that's 100 years from now. My, my, my grandkids look at me, and sometimes I'm just tired, and they'll say, is it because you're old, Grandpa? I say, smack you. Well, probably. <laughs> and I need to have enough cash for emergencies. Very few of us have more, more, very few of us have enough cash to get us more than like a month down the road. That's the paycheck. We, we need to save up a reserve. In fact, I was looking at some statistics here about retirement. And listen to this, please. Listen carefully. More, more than half, more than half of black and Hispanic households have no retirement savings. Zero. Zilch. And then it says less than a third, on the other hand, of white households don't have retirement. Less than a third. So that means about two-thirds of them have some. Okay? And... Um, Black and Hispanic households who do have some savings have put away a lot less towards retirement. And look at these numbers. For the average white household, between 25 and 61, about $80,000 in retirement savings. Okay. For Asian Americans, about 68000 Black, about 29000 Hispanic, 23000 Guys, we've got some catching up to do. And here at the church... I will be speaking more about this, okay? I will be encouraging you guys more and more. And it may not sound spiritual, but hey, when you're in lack, you're on your knees. You're praying. Better to have it set aside. Amen? The retirement income now. Whites, roughly, annually, 23000 24000 annually, retirement income. Blacks, 16,000. Hispanics, Social Security check, 12,000, 13,000 a year. Is it possible to live on 13,000 a year? It's hard. It's not impossible, but it's hard. And we should have some cash set aside uh, for emergencies. This is God's solution right here in Proverbs 6. Verses 6 and 8. It says, go to the ant. God in his wisdom. I was, uh, I was telling the people, and it comes out a little harsher in Spanish. Have you ever seen una hormiga arrastrada? No. What is that? A lazy ant. There are no lazy ants. They're dead. All the other ants that you see are hustling. They're moving they're going from here to there. They go and they come back with something, right? They do. They go and they come back, and they're in a hurry and get out of my way. And you know, that's it. and and that that's what God says. He says, "You lazy bones, look at the ant. Nobody's cracking the whip. But what are they doing in the summertime when there's food? They're storing it up for the wintertime when there's no food." And it says, "Duh." And I go back to Pastor's example, it's, it's they putting it aside, little by little. I'm, I think I'm going to have Brother Zeke, his dad is the one uh, who, who does a lot of insurance right now, to give me some figures for how much you need to set aside now if you're 20, 25, or 30, and for you to be a millionaire. 
before you retire. Okay? For us who are further along, we're going to need to put aside a little more. <laughs> but kids, you can retire with money. But you've got to be wise. You've got to do some of these things. And ultimately, our, our hope and our dependence is the Lord. It, it's the Lord. It, it's Jesus, the rock. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. He's the one that we build our foundation on, our life upon. Look at what 1 Corinthians says, and then we're going to finish with this one. Um, for I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. He's talking about that wandering in the desert with Moses. And all passed through the sea, the Red Sea, remember? And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. The rock is Christ. This foundation that we're talking about is a spiritual foundation, but it is a real thing. For our lives to be built upon that which lasts. The truth of the word, and then the resources that open up because you are children of God. You do what you can. By wisdom, a house is established. Unless the Lord builds a house, those who labor in vain are not going to be able to establish it. What does all that mean? It means that when you begin to do these things, all the resources of heaven just back you up. God's word will not return empty to you. It will not. He will do abundantly more than we can imagine or think. We've got to trust him. We move into this new year with faith. We move into this new year with practical things to do, to understand, to be aware of. What does that verse say? Don't owe anybody except to love them. <laughs> Amen? Would you stand up with me? We're going to pass this over to David. Before I do, I want to encourage you. Take the first step into salvation. That's where it starts. When we open our heart to the Lord and we say, I need a Savior. I'm a sinner but you're a mighty Savior, and then he will. He will save you, and he'll set you upon that rock, and then he'll give you the grace, the wisdom, and the understanding to move forward in faith. And build a firm house that when the winds blow and the winds are going to blow, and the rain beats down upon us, and the rain is going to beat down on all of us. But your house is going to stand. Your life will be solid, and you'll do well because of God and Christ. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Those messages aren't always the easiest to hear, aren't they? Yeah, no, I'm, I am the opposite of everything he just said. <laughs> And I, before I, 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 we get ready to pick up our communion and, and everything that goes at the end, I just want to share one thing for the people that are still young, like he says, not old people like us or me, even though I'm probably young to a lot of people. I did everything wrong financially, <laughs> everything, and God is slowly bringing me out, right? So please, if you're young and you're starting or you're in the middle, I cannot stress that enough. I didn't listen. I wish I did. I wish I did, but I didn't. Uh, and, and God's been merciful. But wow, it, whew, it is scary. <laughs> it's scary. So it doesn't have to be is what I want to tell you. It doesn't have to be. Uh, and, and listen to, you know, the savings and, and the, all of those different things that he was speaking of. And if you don't know, and if you have questions, go to individuals that Know what, you know, pastor will help you, Frank will help you, and, you know, and help you with those questions that you have financially. Please, I just cannot stress it enough because, like I said, been there, done that, really, really bad. And I'm very thankful God's helping me out. He's just a blessing. Uh, we're going to get ready to get, to, um, get the elements. So if you want to come up and grab your bread and tasty juice, you're more than welcome.
Yesterday, um, we ta- pastor was talking about uh, how to teach our children, and uh, David had a little David had a basketball game, and the other team didn't have enough players. They only had two, and uh, yeah, and I didn't help. You know, I brought all the bags for the snack people. I put all the bags right on the side of the <laughs> of the court, and you know, they have all these snacks, and there, you know, the other team wasn't going to get anything. They played a little pickup game. And everybody left, and I had only two bag had two bags left, but there were three little players that showed up for the other team. So I'm like, David, we don't have enough bags. And he's like, I'm really sorry for them. That's what, I mean, it, literally, that's what he said. I'm not, I am not joking you. My son says a lot of really harsh things. And I'm working with him, you know, and I don't know where he gets it. But uh, so we're walking the parking lot, and the little kid, he actually asked his dad, why didn't we get bags? I didn't know this. And I stopped David. I said, David, what do you think we should do? And you just hold on to his back. <laughs> and I was like, oh. and I got down on my knee. I said, what do you want the most right now? Said, He's been wanting these little toys. I want that. Do you think God will give it to you if you give that? I said, what do you have in there, David? What do you have? And he'd open it. I have a juice and I have uh, all these different, you know, snacks. I said, do, don't we have all that at home? Isn't it already there? God's telling you this. This is something for somebody. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we do. I said, but you don't have what you want. So what can you do? And he's like, I said, maybe we can, you think that little boy, he will, you know, can we give it to him? <sighs> I'm not, this is not an exaggeration. And he goes like that. And I grab and I ran to the little boy. He was crying because they lost the game and they couldn't play. And the, little, the dad said, man, thank you. I cannot thank you enough. I said, no, this is from God. It's a blessing. Went back. My son was ready in the car. When are we going to get this thing? When is it coming? You know, I mean, it was awesome. I mean, it's a concept that he learns, you know, and it was just, man, he is the biggest teacher to me, and it's the scariest thing. This is what 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks and broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink. Drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You may take the bread and and drink. Praise God. Sometimes we just don't hear God's voice. And it's the simplest thing. Amen? He really does. Uh, I mean, in the most crucial parts of my life, and I'm, I'm, I don't mean, I just, Pastor did an awesome job. He, he really, really spoke to me. God really spoke to, really confirmed some things that I've been praying about. In the most difficult times in my life, he is right. And I, I mean, I know, it. oh, you say that. No, I'm serious. I, I went through a church split. It was horrible. It was horrible. It was not fun. And I was the pastor that got picked to do the next Sunday service. It was not fun. And everybody was hurt and crying and people were upset. It was, it was not. I remember sitting in my office and I, was, I just wanted to go away. I wanted to leave. And I, I kid you not, I, it was like someone whispered in my ear. He said, feed my sheep. Stay and feed my sheep. And I was like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> this is not a place. I'm scared. You know, I was very young. Well, not like I'm real old, but I was very extremely young. And it's what God wanted. It, it was a blessing. It was, I, had, I enjoyed the service. And I, I think everything that Pastor's saying is he's right on, man. Get in the word and listen to God. He's speaking all the time. We're just not always listening. Amen. But if I can, before you go, I just want to speak this blessing. So I want you to lift your hands or, or hold someone next to you or if your sons and daughters. What I do with my children, I put my hand over them. Every time the pastor does his blessings, like this is for you. This is what I'm in my spirit. I'm just saying that for my kids. So I want to, as I speak, speak this over you, please receive it, take it with you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for such an anointed word today, Lord. We thank you for...
the Holy Spirit, your blessing for the, the assembly of one to another. Father God, we ask, Lord, as we leave this building, that we take it with us, we, we invest in it, we practice it, Lord, we absorb it, we share it with others, Father God. We pray for a wonderful week of work in school, Lord Jesus. We pray for healing upon all of those that are, are sick, Father God. We, we just trust you as the great healer, Father, and we love you and praise you, Father God, and we just ask for more of you and less of ourselves in our daily life, Lord. In Jesus' name, everyone says amen. God bless you guys. Greet someone before you go. Yes, you can give the Lord a big hand clap before you go. That would be a blessing. Amen. And greet someone before you go.